Hello, so this movie will try to navigate you through data reduction of uh, data from our USAC SAXWAX instrument. And at the beginning, let me just do a little introduction about the USAC SAXWAX instrument, our ultra small angle X ray facility, the advanced photon source at the Beamline 9 ID. If you look on the web page, usaxxrayapsnl.gov, you will find the most up to date information about the instrument itself. This is a very unique instrument which provides probably worldwide widest range of scattering vectors or sizes which can be measured during one measurement. It is a combined advanced design Bonse Hart camera as you can see here with integrated fixed length pinhole sex camera and a wax camera. So basically it's an instrument and down here is a sketch of it, which uses a complicated Bonze Hart setup where we have two parallel crystals here. That's an artificial channel cut, which is used to collimate the beam. We have some kind of optics out here. We have a sample and when the beam passes through the sample, it now contains a part of it is small angle and wide angle scattering. In order to analyze that, we now have a channel cut crystal here. That is the USAX instrument. We have a detector, which in our case is a photodiode. And as we rotate this second channel cut crystal, we can collect on the photodiode intensity as a function of an angle. And we can scan ultra small angle and small angle, small angle range. When we run out of intensity range on this complicated Bonze Hart system, we will move it out of the beam. We can drop in a six det sex detector with a chamber, in our case now that's a vacuum uh, chamber, not helium filled, but it's a vacuum chamber. It drops in place and then we can measure a second range of sizes with the sex and then we can move it out and we have a wax detector. So at the end of the day, we have three different detectors which can be used to measure different angle ranges. And I have a picture here which shows that to you, a sketch from one of our publication. This red curve is a USAX data, so we start around 10 to minus 4 inverse angstroms. That is a very, very small angle. Um, that is a resolution of the instrument we actually measure down to Q equals 0, but that is a primary peak. So we can resolve data around 10 to minus 4 inverse angstroms in a standard resolution. And the USAX collects data all the way up to about 0 0.2, 0 0.3 inverse angstroms, somewhere up here. Typically, we run out of photons by this time. There's basically only electronic background. So then what we do is we go and move the USAX out, put in the SACs, and in this case you can see that's a range of data which the SACs would measure, somehow truncated. Usually we measure to slightly lower Qs, but it doesn't matter. Um, and then it goes all the way over one inverse angstroms, at which point we have a wax, and that's the powder diffraction data. That's a powder diffraction or... Uh, wide angle scattering, those are synonyma for that. And so if you combine this one, two, and three segments, you get data over one, two, three, four, four and a half or so uh, uh, decades in sizes from basically microns down to an angstrom or so behind that. So here are some more pictures. For example, this is a kind of cool picture where you can see as a, a small angle scattering, this is a ultra small angle scattering range without the sax actually, this is just a USAX range. And you can see how uh, the structure changes as a function of, uh, in this case, time and temperature. Uh, this is the same inset, uh, contains powder diffraction data. So this is a, this is a despacing. Uh, so these are diffraction peaks. And here is the time and temperature dependence, which gives you the color scale. So you start at room temperature and over about 240 minutes, you reach up to 1100 degrees centigrade. So this is a typical example of the stuff we do. Uh, here is another nice data set combined together where you have USACs, there's a SAX and there's a WAX. And what I want to do in the next about 45 minutes is walk you through a, a test data set I have generated, which will allow us to generate this type of curve. So in this case, you start here, 10 to minus 4 inverse angstroms, few microns, and you go down all the way up to you know, powder diffraction and regular one to about 6 um, in our case, at this time, about six inverse angstroms. So it gets you about one D of D, D spacing, about one angstrom. There are some other examples here.
The important thing here, which you will see in a second, is that there's also software links. Let me do that. So <clears throat> in order to reduce the data, what is it you're going to have? How are the data going to look like? So if you are looking on data which came from a USAX instrument, you will probably have three folders of data. I have created them here. And each one of them has a name. That's um, a name given to your data by us. And then it has an underbar. And then you have a USAX, SAX, and WAX. In each one of these folders, you are going to have some number of HDF5 files. These, will, these are USAX data. They have a name and they have an order number. And then that's a USAC segment, that's a SAC segment, and that's a WAC segment down here. Now, unless you did something really, really bad to uh, the programming, what you should have is you should have in each one of these folders, you should have a same name, completely same name, including this what we call order number. So these order numbers are increased automatically as you're collecting data after collecting USAX with an order number of 65, the next one's going to have 66, 67, and so on. Sometime a one of them may for some reason be missing, but that's okay. But there shouldn't be two with the same order number. And the way the software works, it attempts to make sure that when you collect um, USAX data in a sequence, SAX data in a sequence, and WAX data in a sequence, that all of us, the appropriate USAX, SAX, and WAX um, segments have the same order number. Um, it is possible to, you know, torpedo the functionality of this, but uh, most users will luckily not do it. So most likely you have a three sample files uh, which relate to your sample. If you didn't measure all three segments, you may have only two or even one. Um, also, what you need to have is an instrumental curve. So every one of these will have to have some kind of what we call blank. Blank is either a uh, empty container. So if your sample is in capillary, that would be empty capillary or capillary with water. That depends on what type of sample you have inside the capillary. Or in this case, these are simply pieces of something. And I actually don't remember what that was, but something. And so in that case, what you have is a simply an space, empty space. There's nothing there. So that's an air blank, what we call air blank. You have to have an instrumental curve or a blank or empty measurement. Those are synonyma. You have to have that to reduce data. If you don't, you cannot reduce the data. So it's critical that you collect these. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is walk you through a procedure how to convert these uh, three segments into a three segments in Igor Pro, which are reduced, and then I'm going to help you to match them together. Now, let's go to Igor Pro. If you look, if you look on Igor Pro, you should install Igor Pro Seven, and then you should have installed my packages. So if they are installed correctly, then when you click on macros, you can load in either Nika individually, Irina individually, or a combination, or USEX macros, they are called Indra, or a combination of those. If you do not have this, you want to go to my web page. And on the left-hand side, you can pick, for example, Irina. There's a description here, a few other things. There is a link for a GitHub installer. GitHub installer is a uh, Igor experiment. So you will run that in Igor, and you will follow a instruction movie, which is on the YouTube channel. It will help you to install my packages. Now, at this moment, which is uh, November 2nd, 2017. The current release is from May. Um, I am going to push a new release uh, to the GitHub and to the web pages probably in 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 a week or less. And, and the the movie which I am the, uh, recording now is actually using the current version. So it's going to be a November something release which will have the current version of that. There are some significant changes for the USAX data reduction, especially for the SAX and WAX data reduction. So uh, you may want to make sure that you're using the right version of the macros. So let me just hide that.
and go back here. So we are in Igor. Uh, we're going to load USAX, Irina, and Mika. Okay, so when you load the packages and let Igor recompile the macros, you will end up with some readme here, which is for USAX. You will end up with SAS and SAS2D. So this is USAX data reduction. That's a NICA, a SAX, and WAX data reduction. That's actually steps following it. Okay, so we have that. Um, what we want to do is first, you want to do a reduction on USAX data. That is not totally critical to do it in this order, but it's helpful to do it. So uh, you can start with it. So you do import and reduce USAX data which will open up a panel. On the panel itself, you start from the top, you select data path, and you navigate to the folder which contains the USAX data. Say open. When you do it, it will list you the content of the folder here. We measured blank or instrumental curve, then we measured number of samples, then we measured another blank here. Okay. If this little checkbox is checked, you are going to reduce the data as a blank themselves. So I'm going to pick a blank sample. You can double click or you can hit load and process one. Both of them do the same thing. They will generate a graph. The graph has been corrected. There's lots of steps which have been done in order to get to this graph. But at the end of the day, this is an intensity measured on a photodiode. And this one here in the inset is plotted against an angle of our rotational stage. Somewhere exactly in the middle of this is a Q equals zero. That's a moment where the channel cut crystal was perfectly aligned with the other channel cut crystal on the USAX instrument. That's our Q equals zero. We obtain that value by fitting this modified Gaussian curve that's pushed, put it down by this button here. We fit that to the data over about top 50% of intensity range. And we extract some numbers from that. And the numbers is four at half max. It's about two arc seconds. If you go to higher X-ray energies, this is 21. If you go to higher ones, it's going to be less. If you go to lower ones, it's going to be more. If you're down at 12 kiloelectron volts, like 3.5 or so. Maximum, that is a position of the, you know, the height of the beam. Uh, expressed in the full normalization which we happen to use that day and then beam center which gives you q equals zero so this describes the peak of that now <clears throat> one thing to note is that as we are collecting data we are measuring current on the photodiode with an amplifier but in order for our collecting system to work reasonably well we are actually switching the ranges on the amplifier and we have five range changes which are offset by a factor of 100 this is range one the lowest um, lowest gain least gain more 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 and more you actually have them spelled out here including the colors so the lowest gain is 10 to the 4 the highest one is 10 to the 12 and in between those and where the color changes are once in a while you will find an artifact if that happens there is a tool which removes the dropouts. You can play with it. You can see if you can remove them. There are parameters here which help you to remove them. Typically, the dropout time and the dropout fraction are useful to change. Uh, but the easiest way is to just come to the Beamline scientist and show them the data and ask them to help you. And we will explain how to fix the data problem. Usually, these range changes just require to be cleaned up manually and then everything works well. Notice that this button is red, which tells you you didn't save data. Data are not saved. If you save the data, it just creates a proper copy of these data and stores it inside inside the Igor experiment. I'll show you where that is. Um, so once we have a blank, we can uncheck this. Um, and then we can pick a sample. And for that specific sample, we can put a blank. Now, I suggest measuring more blanks. Here is a second blank here, which in this case looked exactly the same as the first one, so I didn't bother about working with that. But in case the instrument would have some creep or there would be some other accident which caused the instrument curve to change, uh, it is worthwhile to have more than one blank. So you can pick the one which most resembles the instrumental curve when you measure the data. So now I'm going to select this sample here 
and I have the right blank, so a combination sample and a blank, and I can process. It replots this. Now, what you can see is you can see that the uh, data curve was again fitted with the blue curve here, and it gets a nice fit. It gives us a full weighted half max, maximum, and beam center. Now, the maximum here is the maximum height and this position that actually turns out to be, if you look on them, if you compare them from the blank and from the sample, the ratio of the maxima gives you a transmission. You can actually see it on this graph here. If you click on that, that ratio gave you this transmission. This transmission is basically matching the peak height uh, of the sample and the blank, and the blank is black and the sample is red, and you can see that 48% or 0.48 matches that perfectly fine. Um, next, what we want to do is make sure that this cursor here is defining where your start of the data is. The instrumental resolution is given by the full width half max of this peak here, and that puts you just about somewhere about 10 to minus 4. It's actually slightly below that. It's critical to make sure that you put this cursor on the right place where your data already deviate enough from your sum, from your instrumental curve. Because this is a log scale, it's very easy to get a linear scale difference between two quickly rising data, but there may not be too much value into it. And so if you hit recalculate, it will recalculate with the position here. This Q min position where your sample deviates from the from the background, this is your decision. And it's very important to make it right. Uh, some samples scatter at very low Q like this one. Some samples deviate all the way up at high Q because there's no scattering at low Q. Or sometimes you can find out this data between in this range may be very, very noisy because there is a very little scattering coming out of the samples. And so uh, you really want to make sure that you make, you know, you make a good decision where the data really deviate from the instrumental curve so you know you can rely on the values there. So with this one here, we can then make other decisions. So what do we do next? Now, when we collect the data, this black curve actually has 8,000 points. You can see that points are relatively sparse here, but as you go all the way up here in the high angles, there's a lots and lots of points. And the same thing is in the red curve. There's a lots and lots of points out there. That is 8,000 points for the black and red, and principally you can subtract them and get about 8,000 points difference between them. But that's not very helpful because fitting 8,000 points, especially out here, would be quite noisy, is actually not really an easy thing to do. Most software will just don't have enough CPU to deal with that. So what we do is we rebind the data on a log scale to less numbers. 300 is typically OK. On slow machines, people use 100. We used to use 100 for a long time. You can see that it's quite sparse. It still describes the data reasonably well, but obviously, like here is a feature which is nearly wiped out by not enough points. Uh, if you have Bessel function oscillation, diffraction peaks, or anything else, you might need to go a lot more. This is 1,000 points. That is seems to be an overkill for this data. So, you know, 300 seems okay, but, you know, some data sets will require different numbers. And so talk with the beamline scientist if you feel that's necessary. We actually measure transmission multiple times. So there are actually two transmissions in this. There's a diode transmission, which has been measured, which gives you 52%. Peak to peak transmission could be 48%. It actually doesn't matter too much which one is used. And internally, we sort it out. Don't worry about that. If you want to put data on absolute scale, and there are three different calibrations, arbitrary, which means don't worry about calibration. Calibrate in centimeter square per centimeter cube. That means per volume of the sample. For that, we need to know the volume of the sample, basically the sample thickness. So if you know the sample thickness, it's here. In this case, what we try to do is always put the sample thickness in at the beginning of the start of the measurement. So it, it user doesn't have to remember it. Uh, if that was set correctly, like in this case, it's 2.127 millimeters, then you don't have to worry about anything. Data are on absolute scale in centimeter square per centimeter cube. You can override that value here. So if you know that it's a different number because you 
just made a mistake, then you can write it up here. If you have a sequence of, of samples which all need to have set the thickness to something else, you can type the number here and that's going to always override that one. So this one stays between different samples. It is possible to calibrate data in centimeter square per gram. It gets a bit complicated, you need to know a lot more. So if you want to do that, that's useful for powders, for example. So if you want to do that, come to the Beamline Scientist and talk with us. Now, if you're going to use, ignore ignore these other ones, it's kind of sometimes useful to click here and you can see the different segments as they were collected. Sometimes there's an artifact. Again, the artifacts usually can be removed by using this remove fly scan dropouts and changing the parameters here if necessary. Uh, or the easiest way is just to come to me or Ivan or, or another, someone another from the instrument and we will be happy to help you to, to remove them. Ignore geometry, ignore calibration, ignore MSACs, that's not necessary. One thing you may not need to ignore or you may not want to ignore is T smearing. If you are using uh, IRENA for modeling of your data only, IRENA does understand a slit smear data and so you don't have to desmear data. This instrument is using a slit smeared geometry, so it is has a vertically very high collimation, about 10 to minus 4 inverse angstroms, very high resolution, but horizontally is wide open, and that causes changes in the way it collects intensity. IRENA knows how to slit smear the model, so you can use slit smear data and fit them directly with the model. And it's preferable because desmearing increases noise on the data, especially on weekly scattering samples. These ones are actually easy to do. However, if you want to use any other package or any other way of analyzing data, including like Guinea plot in your favorite plotting tool or writing your own Python code or anything else, you have to desmear the data. I don't believe there is any other package in the world at this time which knows how to handle our slit smearing correctly. So what you want to do is do a click here, desmear data. Now, there's a little dotted red line in this area here. Notice that. There is an extrapolation of data needed. Ignore why and how. And uh, what you want to do is you want to select a function which will fit the data well. So... <coughs> In order to extrapolate data and do proper desmearing, I have to have a good fit to the end of data here. In order to do that, I need you to select a proper extension function. This will work really well. And typically it will be either flat background, there is no scattering, or it's a power law with flat background if there is a scattering. What happens is the blue curve, which is the slit smear data, which you can see all the way here, then gets desmeared automatically. That's the green curve. And notice how much more intensity dynamic range you get. So the desmeared data are actually much higher dynamic range. That's because the slit smearing is effectively something you can think about as a rolling average. So, and by the way, this dotted line here, that's a normalized residuals from the desmearing. So if it's between plus minus one, you are okay. Um, so in this case, the code will generate blue curve, which is slit smear data, and the green curve, which is the smear data. The desmear data have an advantage that you can then use them in any package, including IRENA, but mainly also uh, other packages outside of IRENA, and it will fit with all the guinea plots and everything else. All the other data, are, the, the models are okay with that. Whereas the slit smearing requires IRENA, which understands how to include the slit smearing inside the modeling. So if you want to do something with those uh, future data in the future outside of my packages, you may want to desmear the data. Uh, that works really well on data like these, which scatter really, really well. I mean, there's a lots and lots of scattering in here. However, that may not work as well if you are using, um, if your samples scatter weakly. Anyway, when you are happy about that, you hit save. What happens is it will save the data and it will generate your graph so you see what's happening. Now, in this case, it's relatively easy. We can actually go select the rest of the samples and simply hit process and process many, it will go through it and process the data one after another. So that's another data set. And then 
every time it processes data set the display here display delay down here and if that's set to five seconds it sleeps between the two different samples for five seconds the reason why it's there is so you can actually look at it and decide if that went okay or not if there are any artifacts which need you to revisit the data you may actually have to uh, do it afterwards so you want to scribble down in that case which data set didn't work out for uh, properly and, uh, and and look at it later on you can move it around and so you can see how that changes if everything is this strong and this well behaved things are easy if you start looking on samples which are weakly scattering uh, where the precisions which you are required are actually very significant you may find it a bit more complicated to get the right uh, answers if you run into troubles here with this again what you want to do is talk with the beamline scientist me Ivan or anyone else from the instrument and we will try to figure out how to help you with uh, the uh, uh, with the data reduction so <clears throat> let me close this close that and close that what you now have end up with this is a data browser inside this Igor experiment. So let's first do one thing. Let's save the Igor experiment. And let's just save it, whatever the name is, next to the data. And inside the Igor experiment, if you don't see the data browser go in, there's a data browser here. Make sure you have checked waves and, you know, you can uncheck that. That doesn't matter. Info and plot is useful. Data inside Igor are... Uh, organized in folders uh, ignore anything which is in a packages folders those are temporary data uh, more or less ignore anything which is in a raw folder that gets deleted when needed and then inside the usex folder now what you see is an air blank uh, inside the air blank are some funny wave names like blank r intensity so you can ignore those those are the blank data but if you look on sample this is your sample, so it has the same name as the file name uh, outside, which you provided uh, into in, in, in the system. That itself, uh, and by the way, it is limited to 32 characters. So if your file name is too long, this will be truncated by some ugly way. Inside the folder, the things which you are really interested in are the SMR, Q vector, intensity, error, and DQ. These are slit smear data. If you did the D smearing, there is another copy which is DSM, D smeared Q, intensity, error, uh, or uncertainty for intensity, and DQ. The DQ is a is is a Q resolution for every point calculated. That's not the slit length. Slit length is in the other direction. This is in the high resolution direction. There's a Q resolution because of the way the data are collected. Most of the time you can ignore the DQ unless you have some very sharp, uh, sharp features in your system. And so what we end up with, we have now sample 3, 1, 3, 3, 3, 4, and so on. Each one of the measurements has a one folder inside which will be one set of data. <clears throat> so that's the USAX itself. Now what we need to do is we need to do SAX. And so to do SAX, we use SAS2D, which is a Nika package, and it has a configurator. So you go down here until you find instrument configurations. In there, you now find the 9IDC and so on. You click on it, and it pops up instructions, and it pops up a panel. With this panel, it has down here instructions what to do. So you are doing SAX. So SAX is checked. This tells you set default settings button now. What it wants you to do is find a folder with SAX data and find any file inside there, any sample measurement inside there, not calibration file, sample measurement. You hit open and it opens up. Okay. It automatically loads all the parameters, sorts out everything else. Notice what this is saying, load empty blank and set slit length. So what we want to do is go in here, it open up actually a tab for empty blank and you can select the one which we used for USAX, which is the 64, hit load empty. And then you can come here and hit set slit length. It picks up here and you can pick any one of these USAX folders and hit continue. That will copy the slit length in here. 
Now, if you know the slit link, you just simply type it in here. That's the same thing. Now, there's a checkbox here, create smear data. If you have <coughs> only USAX data, slit smeared USAX data, you didn't do the desmearing. So all your data analysis will be inside IRENA. You don't want to take it out and take it with you to some other package. If that's the case, then you want to create a slit smear data. If you created the pinhole collimated data, the desmear data, and uh, then you may not need the slit smear data, then you can uncheck that. And I'll show you what that would do. Um, now, out here, the other thing here is uh, useful controls. We will reduce the number of points, which is about 480 across the vertical distance. We will reduce that down to about 120 using basically log binning. So we're going to take very small steps at small sizes. As we go to larger sizes, which you're going to take a bigger steps. That generates generally better data sets for uh, processing. In case you have sharp features like diffraction peaks, uh, in the SACS region and you want to characterize well the diffraction peaks, you may have to check the maximum number of points. That gets you noisier data, but the number of points is equal to the number of pixels along the vertical direction, so it gets you the highest resolution. That's how the powder diffraction uh, segment works always. But in our case, we don't care about that. So <clears throat> we leave it as it is. And then basically, if you go to the main, notice that distance is set, wavelength is set, all the other parameters are set, everything was read from the Nexus files themselves. There are functions which will find the thickness inside the Nexus file, it will find the transmission and calculate the transmission, it will find I0 and empty I0, so all the normalization based on the formula which you have here can be done. What you want to do is go in here, possibly sort it out, select the range of samples actually what i remember is we cannot this one here is not a good measurement so we just select all of those and simply say convert and it will go in and it will generate a data set for each image now notice in the graph here you have a sample 310665 and then you have two two uh, data sets for it. The one is underbar 27030. That one is a for desmear data. That one is equivalent to desmear data. That's the kind of pinhole collimation. The underbar U is a slit smeared version. Now, in this case, we actually had made a mistake when we collected the data because the sample scattered so strongly. We actually measured <coughs> too long time. And as we measured the too long time, we have over counted so this 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 detector has a million million counts per pixel well what you see here we reach that million and so the data here are contaminated we will be able to remove that in the next step other than that you have these beautiful shapes which are not that helpful but they are what they are it's the data anyway so we finished now the sacks when you finish with the sacks you can go to wax so after you finish all the sex data, you can go in here, you click on the wax. It again says push set default settings button now. You do that. You want to find the folder where your wax data are. And you want to pick on any one of those data files. You can see that the data file is bigger. It's a larger camera. Uh, there's really nothing much more to do except load empty and blank. So you go in here and you want to load the empty, that's fine. And then you can come in here, select the files which you collected and simply say convert. In this case, <coughs> what you, you can see is each one of them gets just one segment, uh, one representation and it's under bar C, which is a circular average. That is an average along a circle around the beam center, but of course there's only so many pixels. So that's basically giving you the highest resolution data it can over this type of detector. So that's a powder diffraction. Uh, don't get surprised. Uh, that six doesn't look too right. The very last one doesn't look correct. Oh, and that's this one here. Should be the one which I wanted to convert. Yeah, there was some mistake. We I think we measured a we we didn't hit the sample. Um, 
So uh, the, the, these data are presented on a log log scale, which is four sacks. And if you want, you can actually change that in a linear linear scale. So that would be here. And you can do linear linear scale. I will probably make it a little bit more reasonable. Anyway, so now what we did is we processed sacks and wax. Let me close all of those all of those images here. Let me show you what we did. <coughs> So, when we process the SAGS data, all the data went in SAGS, and each one of your measurements now has two representations. One is a representation which has a U in a name, that's a slit smear data set, and that one would be merged with the slit smear data, and this one is 27030, that's a pinhole collimated data set. So, that's, so we get each one of them represented twice. And inside each one of these folders, we actually have a different name system. So the Nika is using something called QRS, Q under bar a name, R under bar and a name, and S under bar and a name. And they, and W, by the way, is a resolution. So that's a Q intensity, uncertainty, and that's a Q resolution. Um, and then each one of these has the similar thing in there. With the wide angle scattering segment, it's the same thing. They're stuck in a wide angle scattering folder. They have an underbar C in a name. That's another way. That's all Nika jargon. Uh, inside which you have a Q, R, S, and W, and that's QRS system represented waves. Okay, so now <coughs> we can save the Igor experiment. So if, in case Igor crashes, we don't lose the data. And now we can start looking on how these data will be processed. So we already have now a segment for USAX, SAX, and WAX. Let me show you how they look like. So I'm going to go in IRENA, in plotting tool. In the plotting tool of IRENA, I can uh, pick here that I want to do USAX, and I can pick 3165. And you can see that it picked DSM data. You could pick the slits me data if you want, but let's leave the DSM in there and click OK. This is a USAX data. So you can see one, two, three, and not, not even three and a half, close to three and a half decades in Q comes just for the USAX. If I now switch to QRS and pick in and T put in there the uh, Two three one two seventy thirty. Add that in, say yep. They are not an absolute scale. So these data are on absolute scale. These data are not on absolute scale. That's what that code was telling us. Let me very close. So you have a USAX, you have a SAX, and then if we go in and put the wax in there, we have a wax. So you have a USAX, SAX, and WAX. That's exactly as you have seen on that graph which I showed you. That's a USAX data, SAX data, and a WAX data. Now, what we do need to do next is match these things together. So you have a one nice continuous curve which you can use for something else. <coughs> so in IRENA, there's a, there's a, there are a few data manipulation packages. Uh, data manipulation one would be useful in that you can go in and pick one data set and two data and second data set and do work with them, merge them, subtract them, divide them, all sorts of stuff. Um, it is easier to use this merge to data sets tool. So let me check that. That's here. So here is how to use that. It's, it gets a little bit complicated, so please follow me. So first thing is you're going to use USAX data as an input. And if you click here and check back, what it's going to do is it's going to put in here a, 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 a regular expression uh, type thing which tells you what is it you want to use for, uh, for merging. And you can click here at QRS. So we're going to have a USAX input DSMIR data QRS. And we're going to look only for folders which contain under bar 270, which shows us these ones. You can pick the right folder. So let's pick SAX and let's pick USAX. It's going to make sure these are very, very short names. This tool actually can sort out the data. So if you do this, it will sort them out in such a way that the appropriate segments should be on the same line. <coughs> let's leave this in a test mode for now and just double click this one and double click this one. Now, 
we need to tell the code which data to use for overlap. And this early data, the very top part here in this case, has been over flooded by too long exposure. So we need to remove that. So we're going to move the cursor somewhere up here. Typically, if this doesn't happen, you can go all the way up to the first point. Out here, you probably want to go, yeah, in this case, it's OK. But sometimes there's just noisy flat backgrounds. So you may want to go higher you still have to have a reasonable range of data which overlap together. Sometimes that causes issues. Then actually there are two merging methods. One of them is merging with two parameters. In this case, when you use merge, that's this one here, you just push that button here, it scales data set two. So it scales this guy, the black guy, down to the red one. And it does a flat background subtraction from data set one. So it actually, and then slaps those things together, truncates data outside and so on. <clears throat> Since the pinhole sax camera have slight uncertainty in Q position, you can also use test merge too. What that would do is it would also allow a little shift of the data set two in Q. Uh, once you decide which one of these uh, methods works well, you can pick it up here. So I'm going to use merge two. I'm going to start with process individually and save indivi immediately. So in that case, I can double click here, double click here, and it will generate the blue curve so, and, and save it. So it actually tells you down here in what is called history area. This is a history area. So basically it tells you what it did here. And down here it's described. So data set one, data set two, and it created new data set, which now has the same name as the USAX. It's still the USAX data, but it has an underbar MRG in there. That actually you can change here in this field if you want. Now, if you have a lots of data, but they all look similar, similar and same, you can select them as long as they're lined up. So if you select them, in the, independent of if this is continuous and, and how that lays out, it will take, and if you run it automatically, it will take a first one selected here and measure with the first one selected here. They don't have to be on the same line. It's going to be the first selected here with first selected here, second here, second here, and so on. In this case, they're all nicely lined up, so we can just simply look at it. This thing is a button, and so we can go in and process as a sequence, and now it says process and save data. And you just hit enter. And it has a little delay again. So it goes in, matches the data. And if it would fail somewhere, you want to write down on a piece of paper where it failed, which sample you need to look at back. And then you can go back and manually in a individual processing mode, you can play with it. And you can, for example, change the Q range, which is overlapping, you know, change the method, whatever is appropriate. Um, but, you know, on these data sets, it very, very nicely merged together. OK, so we're done. Let me close that. Let me come back here and show you what we did. So inside the USEX folder, now what you can see is there was a sample 1, 65. That's the USEX segment. By running it through the merging routine, we now have that one under bar merge. That's the USEX plus sex. How does it look like? And we have it for each sample we processed. And if you look at that, we go back to USEX here. We pick sample 1 merged. At yes, we just changed that. And what you can see is you can see that the original rat has now been corrected and extended by the sacks. So we basically took the sacks, took advantage of the fact that the USEX data are on absolute scale. We scale it together with the sacks and we expanded that all the way here. So we have now data going all the way to 1.05 or so or 1.04. So that's nice. Now what we want to do is stitch it together with these green ones. To do that, we go back and go to data manipulation, match to data sets. In this case, <coughs> what we want to do is type in here under bar MRG. We're going to see only the match data. In here, we want to go in for wax data, but we don't, we can do under bar C. It's going to see all those. And then we can do sort it out. And that, of course, doesn't work because it's not correct at this moment, doesn't matter. So now what we have is we have these and these. Let's go back to test mode. We go here and we go here. Now what we need to do is select the range of data which will overlap. So we're going to select the very last point here and actually out here, I don't know if you can see that, but that rounded cursor is on the very beginning here. 
if we just do maybe test match two, you can see there's enough overlap to actually stitch these two curves together. So we'll do this test match two, process as a sequence, save immediately. We have them sorted out. So we get this, that, except this one is incorrect because that one is 76. So that's 75, 75, 74, 73, and so on. That's 78, and that's 78. So we're going to skip that one here and say process. Oh, that process. And so what it's doing, it's processing the data now for us and matching them together for all of these data sets. And you can see that. Sometimes this, this doesn't work automatically enough. You have to do it manually, but you know, that's life. Uh, it depends on quality of the data. These data scatter really well. Now, what we did is we now generated for each one of our USAX data sets yet another one, which was the merge data. That's USAX. So that's USAX. That's USAX plus SAX. That's USAX plus SAX plus WAX. Okay. So we can go in and pick that one, add the data in, and now you have that. So now what you have is you have USAX extended with SAX, extended with WAX all the way out here. Now, of course, you know, the WAX data may need to be analyzed by different tools, so you don't necessarily have to match these data always together. It's kind of cool to see that you have one, two, three, four, four and a half decades in sizes measured in about three minutes or so. And if there's something to be known from diffraction and scattering, then you'd better know it from these data or you cannot really use these techniques to tell you much more. Anyway, so now we have these data what you can do with them, of course, you can now analyze them with USAX, uh, with IRENA. So you have a unified fit size distribution modeling, all sorts of tools in IRENA. There's lots of movies I already made on that thing. The other thing is you can go in and export ASCII data in the current version, which I'm going to release, as I said, in a few days. You can release this will, there's a data picker here and there's a somewhere movie and there's a manual, there's an online manual which you can get from here. So that will help you to do that. Um, the new feature on this one, you can export ASCII. That's typically Q, intensity and error. Um, you can export GCS to XYE. That one, it will always export two data, uh, intensity and uncertainty. That's meant to be used by GSAS or GSAS tool, or other powder diffraction profiles. It's really worthwhile only for the WAX data, uh, WAX data processing. There's an export Nexus. Nexus is a way of, of storing data in HDFI files, and there's a standard for that, and both IRENA and some other packages can import or export Nexus, so that's useful and that should be useful into the future. And so you can actually either model the data here in Igor, or you can save them as ASCII files and or Nexus files and model them in other packages. Well, that's about it. By now you finished all your processing, your, all the data are there. Don't forget to save the Igor experiment. You can, you know, plot the data with plotting tool and you can do all sorts of other things. If you have any questions, you can, you know, email me. You can talk with us. If you have collected data on a USAX instrument, <coughs> we will be more than happy to help you with any data analysis and data processing questions you may have. That's our responsibility to make sure that you're productive. So please feel free to email us and talk with us. Okay, well, that's it. Thank you.